NetWealth Investments Limited is licensed to provide general advice. Our podcasts are not tailored to any one financial situation and may contain views of our presenters which may not align with NetWealth. The guests, organization, and NetWealth have an arrangement for their financial products to be available for investment through NetWealth platforms, and NetWealth may receive fees from the guest. More information about NetWealth can be found at our website, including our financial services guide and disclosure documents. Please seek professional advice before acting. Welcome to the NetWealth Portfolio Construction Podcast, brought to you by the NetWealth Investment Research Team. Join us as we speak with key wealth management professionals to uncover opportunities and challenges on a diverse range of topics. Inflation expectations are better anchored these days. And so people seriously didn't think, they're more prepared to believe that the inflation that we got would be temporary. And as a result, it didn't get factored into wage and price sort of spiral. With your host, Paul O'Connor. Good morning all and welcome to the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast. I'm Paul O'Connor and I'm the Head of Strategy and Development for the investment options offered by NetWealth. Recently, we've worked closely with Income Asset Management, or IAM, to make available to our wholesale clients a small parcel bond service. In short, the direct bond market has historically been the domain of institutional investors due to the high minimum trade sizes to purchase a bond, and retail investors have had limited access to bonds on only really on listed securities exchanges. However, NetWealth now offers wholesale investors the opportunity to purchase unlisted bonds with lower minimum investment amounts through IAM, who are a specialist bond broker. IAM is an ASX listed group that delivers a complete income investment service providing investors, advisors and portfolio managers with a modern platform including research and execution to manage income investments. With over 14 years of specialised industry experience and more than $3 billion in assets under administration, IAM covers a broad spectrum of income investments including cash deposits, bonds, asset management and treasury management services. Given the innovative new NetWell small parcel bond service, we thought it would be a great opportunity to have Craig Swanger from IAM join us on today's podcast. Craig is a Director and Chief Investment Officer of IAM and has more than 25 years experience in investment markets, including being the Global Head of Macquarie's Global Investment Unit. He is a highly regarded fintech investment and strategy expert. Craig has built businesses in 14 countries across funds management, wealth, insurance and banking and advises and invests in a portfolio of 12 high growth companies from early stage and rapidly scaling fintech companies. Craig's recently developed his macroeconomic views on what investors can expect over the course of this year and a particular area of focus has been China. Given this specialist knowledge, I thought we would focus today's podcast on the Chinese economy and particularly why Craig believes interest rates will fall faster than general consensus expects as China moves to support economic growth that will see it export inflation. This is a really interesting macroeconomic observation given we have all been recipients of China exporting deflation to the developed world for the last 30 years or so. Recent mainstream media attention has focused on whether the strains in China's property market and mounting debt will lead to a significant economic turndown, so investors are focused on whether a soft landing can be navigated. I'll touch on this topic today, and particularly Craig's view on China starting to export inflation, which will have a bigger impact on the developed world than the Chinese property market slowdown. Having said that, the World Bank projects China's GDP growth to slow down in 2024 to about 4.5% compared to 5.2% in 2023. This slowdown is attributed to factors like a weak real estate sector and sluggish global demand, but the World Bank projection is still a healthy GDP growth rate for the year. Craig, thanks for joining us this morning, and can you start by telling the listeners a bit about the growth of the IAM business and your role as the Chief Investment Officer? Yeah, thanks very much, Paul, and thanks for the invite. I was Chief Investment Officer at Macquarie Group back in around the crossing over the time of the global financial crisis. And one of the things that we really learned from that was the power of strategic asset allocation and the difficulty that, particularly in Australia, unlike the other 13 or so countries that I, that we worked in, 
Australia investors really suffer from not being able to invest in, particularly in corporate bonds. I'll make a couple of quick distinctions there. One is it's very easy to invest in fixed interests in Australia. Um, you can you can invest in government fixed interest or semi-government fixed interest, but corporate bonds fall into a, a difficult category, and it's largely just for various um, historic and infrastructure reasons that have meant that the minimum parcel size to invest in a corporate bond is five hundred thousand dollars. So that would mean to to have a, a somewhat diversified portfolio of say ten corporate bonds, you would need five million dollars, well beyond the reach of most people. And so I started while at Macquarie looking at various ways for people to be able to invest in smaller parcel sizes in corporate bonds and found actually even back then, uh, and this is 2013, so this is after the global financial crisis, there were really only uh, two or three different options. And that remains the case today. So it means for investors in Australia, uh, accessing corporate bonds in particular has been and remains a a big challenge. Uh, If you want to have a diversified portfolio of, say, 10 corporate bonds, you need $5 million, and that's well beyond the reach of most most Australian investors. Similarly, you need need to ensure that at the time you want to either buy or sell those bonds, there is trading liquidity. You have access to those. Those two things, you know, smaller parcel size uh, and also having that trading liquidity are really only available from two or three different providers in the Australian market, even today in 2024. And that really makes Australia quite unique. One of the countries, for example, that was under my supervision was New Zealand, much, much smaller than Australia, as much as the uh, the, the Kiwis on the, on the listening to this podcast would hate me to say. New Zealand is substantially smaller and yet has more of a corporate bond trading infrastructure than Australia does. When I had the chance to join the Income Asset Management Board, it was a great opportunity to then say, well, here's a chance to to make a difference to the sorts of investments that Australians can make. And that's why I joined. Yeah, well, it seems to me it's really about democratising bonds and and really opening up the opportunity as you as you've sort of articulated there due to the high investment minimums. And I guess historically, yeah, Australians have just settled for either a, a managed fund or an ETF to get exposure to a a diversified portfolio of fixed income instrument. It's great to hear that this opportunity is opening up to Australian investors, Craig. That's a really succinct way of putting it. It covers on the other point, which is that for a lot of people, managed funds are a really good solution. And I've always been a big believer in managed funds, but also a huge believer in the concept of, as Warren Buffett says, the the substance over form. What people are looking for is the diversification and income benefits that come from corporate bonds in this case. And the form really comes down to how they've chosen to invest. It could be managed funds, could be ETFs, but for a lot of people, uh, for a lot of different reasons, they want direct investments. And it's that direct side. It's kind of like stockbroking relates to shares. What's the equivalent in corporate bonds? And that's the, that's the part that I really loved about the idea that income asset management had was let people buy corporate bonds in the form that they want through funds, through ETFs, through a model portfolio on platforms like NetWealth or just buy them directly. Again, on or off platform, it doesn't matter. The whole point is I want the access to the substance of that, the benefits of that corporate bond, regardless of the form. You're preaching to the converted in myself there, Craig, given the, um, we saw, I thought that was the great opportunity of of partnering up with IAM and offering this service to uh, the small parcel bond service to our investors. So um, it'll be great to see how it develops over time. Moving on to the topic today for the podcast. The Chinese economy's never fully recovered back to the pre-COVID GDP growth rates and, and seems to be slowing again. China's faced risks before, but why might this time be more of a concern for Australian investors? It's a great question to open the, the topic with because the first thing to say is that China's growth slowing, as it were, from uh, 5.2 to 4.5% or whatever this, the, the slow rate will be between 2023 and 2024. The sheer size of the Chinese economy 
means that that growth rate is still really impressive. Personally, I don't believe that it, that China will actually achieve that growth rate. But even if it achieves two or three percent from the size it is right now, that's still really impressive. However, investments typically are priced on the basis of their growth uh, or other metrics that relate to that, the change, not the size of the investment. Uh, and that's really what worries me right now when it comes to China, is that the perception of the ability of the Chinese economy to continue growing at the pace that it has outruns the reality. Uh, China is not able to keep up its its growth rate. Uh, that's it has been in the last few years, and there's a range of reasons for that. Um, but the single biggest challenge that they've faced in the last 20 to 25 years is the current challenge of the growth rate uh, of residential property development. And the reason that concerns me in particular um, is as an Australian investor, it has a, both a direct and an indirect impact that far exceeds that for our peers uh, in the OECD, particularly for Europe and the US. So to explain those points in a little bit more detail, residential property development has accounted for around about one quarter, 25% of GDP growth uh, in China over the last 25 years. And that has largely come from a trend called urbanization. Uh, the urbanization is not unique to China at all. It's the same trend that saw New York grow from its uh, 3 million people to 8 million people, um, well, actually around about 100 and over 100 years ago now. Uh, Paris, London, uh, Tokyo were all exactly the same. Now, today, the four largest cities in the world are all Chinese. Uh, the next after that is Tokyo, and then you've got cities like uh, Mexico City or Lagos uh, in Nigeria that are growing to be the world's largest, and it'll be Delhi and Mumbai after that. Urbanization is a trend that occurs whenever an economy starts to go from being largely agricultural and people live in the country to being all about or uh, well, largely about manufacturing. And, and so China has seen 25 or 30 years of this enormous urbanization trend. When you've got over a billion people, 30% of your population, which is typically the, the uh, percentage of the population that moves in an urbanization trend, 30% of a billion is a very large number. That, and that is the number of people that have moved to Chinese cities already. Now, here's the problem. What typically happens with urbanization is you see around about 30% of the, of a country's population live in the cities and it grows to 60%. Uh, and then it starts to slow. There are no rules with these things, of course. It could exceed that by a bit, but it's certainly not going to ever get anywhere near uh, 90 or 100%. China has already passed that 60% mark. So what that means is that our expectations of seeing China continue to urbanize, our expectations should start to wane at this stage. We should start to think that that urbanization trend is slowing. And that's certainly what the data shows now is that China's urbanization has started to slow. However, they have continued to develop residential property as if there was still the same level of demand uh, for new property in the cities and the same level of demand for infrastructure in the cities. And that is what is causing the current headaches for the property development sector, along with a range um, of uh, policy changes made out of Beijing. But the major cause is that less and less people, as a percentage of the total population, less and less people are moving to the cities, less and less people are demanding new property, and that is causing uh, headaches for developers because they can't sell it to people who are migrating to the cities. They're forced, therefore, to sell to investors more and more. And that is what's uh, largely causing the headaches for the policymakers, um, because you, the policymakers can't just tell those investors to be confident about that someone will move into their property um, built in the cities. Um, they need you, know, when it comes to people, you need to be far more convincing. Uh, and not just demand that people will continue to invest. That's a very long way of saying residential property slowing in China is a problem. One, because it's a 
very human problem. You can't, you can't force people to move from the country to the city, even in China. Two, once you've started to exceed the natural level of demand, there are, when there's, once there's no longer the families to move into the homes, you need investors. And three, once that investor confidence starts to wane, which it certainly has in China in the last few years, it's very, very hard to recover from that. The sheer size of that, you know, when you're talking 25% of GDP growth, that, that sheer size is a really significant problem for uh, policymakers in China. It's just too hard to replace. I always get the feeling, Craig, that the Western world never really understands China. So how much of this current issue in China's Western media sensationalism versus being a real issue? Look, it's always healthy to be sceptical about the way that the media depicts things and to look at two or three different sources. In this case, the sensationalism, if it exists, really focus on, they, they, they refer to it as ghost cities, implying that there are entire cities in which there are empty buildings and waiting for people to move into. It's not really the case in China. Um, yes, they have, ex they have developed residential property in excess of natural demand. And you would never see that in places uh, like Australia, or you would see it less and less in places like Australia or the US, because property developers would stop faster if they found the demand wasn't there. The level of demand, ex excessive uh, supply relative to the demand um, is somewhere around about two to three years at worst. So we're not talking about entire cities, entire ghost cities, as the media would imply. But what we are talking about is excess demand that if we stop building right now, we would see around, in the base case, around two years of natural demand to the, the people moving to the cities would soak up all of those existing built empty properties within a couple of years. That's saying that the media sensationalize it, but directionally they're correct. There are too many developed properties in Australia, uh, sorry, in China, um, and there are not enough people moving to the cities to absorb that, no matter what you do to policy, to try and uh, increase that demand. There does appear to be some signs of a, of a partial recovery in the commercial real estate market driven by government support and a rebound in consumption. However, no doubt the overall situation in the property market remains a concern. So what are your thoughts on the extent of this Chinese property market downturn? So what the Chinese government has done, and, and to be fair, it's probably about all they can do is they've made sure that the property developers have access to funds to complete the projects they've started. So let's say, for example, that that works and um, the developers are able to borrow the money to complete the projects. And the people who own those apartments um, find themselves with a completed product. You still need someone to move into that property in order for there to be a return on, on that investment. And if the level of urbanization, the, the level of, of people moving to the cities is not high enough, then many of those properties will remain empty. And there is nothing that Beijing can do. It's very, very difficult for Beijing to do enough to be able to influence that. Yes, I think the current policy of making sure that developers have the funds to complete the current projects, that will work for the next year or two at best. But if those properties aren't filled, investors won't buy the next batch and those developers won't uh, start new projects and will start to really feel the crunch in terms of China's GDP growth will lose its single largest growth engine, uh, which has been residential property development. The Chinese Ministry of Finance is aiming to control government spending and reduce debt by implementing austerity measures. I note Fitch Ratings recently revised the outlook on China's sovereign debt to negative due to concerns over property and public finance stress. So do you think the Chinese authorities can manage the economic growth slowdown and navigate a softer landing? I think they can create a softer landing but their level of influence is, is limited. And it's limited because you're dealing in this case, when it comes to residential property investors, you're dealing with real individual people, not corporations. Uh, and they are much harder to impact with the sort of policy approach or the central control approach that China has used in the past. 
a lot of the focus around the level of debt in China is, in my view, is very appropriate. Central debt in China is quite low at around 50 to 60 percent of GDP relative to the rest of the world. That's very low. However, where China has funded uh, most of its residential property financial support and infrastructure spending, which of course supports uh, residential property as well, has been at the local government special purpose vehicle level. And that is in effect guaranteed by local government, which is in effect guaranteed by Beijing. So you need to be, like with most countries, you need to look at the total level of debt, which is the federal level of debt, plus the state or local government level of debt, any state-owned enterprises, um, and then add that to the household sector and the non-bank uh, finance sector to really understand how heavily geared a particular economy is. So for you know, using that as an example, um, Australia is famously has one of the highest levels of household debt in the world. But if you add together our state-owned enterprises, federal government, state government, local government, and that non uh, non-financial business sector with the household sector, we come at somewhere around about 240 to 250% of GDP as a total level of debt. China's is much closer to 400%, which is about the same as Japan. It's because they have that level of uh, local government uh, debt on the infrastructure and the residential um, housing uh, finance support that's what's causing this very high level of of indebtedness right now and that's why the rating agencies are trying to figure out well how do we actually how do we rate the national level of debt how do we rate national issuance of debt when there's this implied guarantee sitting there uh, it's interesting the um, i didn't realize the extent of the debt um, when you take in both the public and the and the private sector as well there craig so very interesting Coming back to your previous question, Paul, when it comes to the media, it's not that they're intentionally misleading the, the reader, but there's a lot of media talk about China's level, low level of indebtedness. And actually, China has a level of indebtedness that is so high that, yes, it's challenging Japan in terms of being uh, the world leader in, in, in indebtedness. Uh, but worse still, Japan has plenty of policy uh, angles that they can take because most of their debt is actually owed to their own uh, pension funds and, and individuals. Whereas in China's case, a lot of it is actually, or the vast majority of it is external to China. Um, and that means that the central policymakers in China are backed into a corner. And that's when it's, it's things really start to get ugly for the Chinese economy overall is how do you replace 25% of GDP growth over the, the last 15 to 20 years. Uh, how do you replace a level of growth with something new uh, without the world losing confidence in China as an as economic growth engine? And, and I guess with also China losing some level of competitiveness as an exporter, given rising wages and, and what have you there as well, it's a, um, it's a, a real dilemma, I guess, for the authorities. Imagine a world where your clients have the best wealth technology at their fingers. With NetWealth's next-gen client portal and mobile app, clients can view and manage their portfolio, assets, and accounts wherever they are. By adding external bank and property feeds to their NetWealth account, they can get a true picture of their wealth. And by giving them the ability to transact and manage their cash, they can feel in control of their wealth. A world of client engagement awaits. Discover it at netwealth.com.au forward slash woo. So, in terms of a China slowdown, what do you think that actually means for global markets? This is the big question for investors. And, it, and it, like most things, it comes down to the two factors of um, perceptions and reality. Um, the growth rate for China, in my view, uh, faces more challenges now than ever before, and, and for all the reasons I've already talked about. So, how will the world markets look at that from a perceptions point of view? My guess is that growth markets in particular, so equities, uh, most of the commodity sector, uh, foreign currency markets be impacted in their own way. They will have a very severe impact because China is, depending on how you measure it, is either the largest or the second largest economy in the world. So if it slows down, it will definitely slow down the global economy. 
Um, hopefully, they can manage a softer landing, as we've talked about. But the perception of the risks that that uh, a China slowdown creates for uh, equity markets, the perception is is going to be um, well. I'm better sitting on the sidelines than I are being involved directly. And, th- and then the second factor kicks in, which is the reality. What's China going to do about this? How are they going to manage a softer landing? Um, and, and how are they going to look for other ways to grow their economy? Is it going to be from exports? Is it going to be a particular sector? Or are they going to be able to manage this um, residential property development slowdown in a way that means they buy themselves a few years and um, come out the other side being hyper competitive as they always have been before? So then from a portfolio construction perspective, how do you think Australian investors should be reacting to this? Look, there's two factors for Aussie investors. The first is the direct impact. The one that really concerns me the most is uh, the iron ore price. Uh, About 36% of Australia's exports specifically relate to the export of iron ore to China. And it's an enormous figure. Put in reverse, around 69% of China's imports of iron ore come from Australia. So whichever way you look at it, there is a high level of dependency. Australia is very dependent for export, uh, the dollar value of its export growth. It's very dependent on China. And China is very dependent on Australia for iron ore. Iron ore is incredibly important for residential uh, property development, both in terms of the houses and or units themselves, but also for the infrastructure. And so China has been, for example, in the recent fights between Canberra and Beijing, uh, iron ore was excluded from any of the discussions around tariff controls and other pricing controls that Beijing could enforce on Australia. As an Australian investor, how do I insulate myself? How do I protect myself from not being exposed should there be a sudden drop in the iron ore price? Well, it's reasonably obvious is you don't buy into any of the companies, whether it's through equities or corporate debt, but you don't buy yourself into into those cash flows. Now, Fortescue is a, is a great example, but uh, BHP and Rio both have a very high exposure to iron ore as well. But the indirect is much harder. And the indirect relates to, a lot of it relates to perceptions. So Australia is seen as being a high, what's called a high beta economy. In other words, when the world is growing strongly and confidently, Australia is, in a great, is perceived to be in a great position. And that's because partly uh, we are a commodity-driven economy. But secondly, actually, when uh, there's more discretionary income globally, um, areas like tourism and education and health benefit. So both our services and our product sector benefit when the world's growing strongly. On the flip side, if the perceptions change and the growth outlook for the world um, falls, then the perceptions of the prospects for Australia really start to fall as well. And that's the indirect knock-on effect is if the world suddenly wakes up and decides that um, the growth story in China is coming to an end, what will be the impact on Australian asset prices? How far will they fall? And when will we switch over from the fear perception cycle into more of the reality of, well, what is the impact of China slowing down and, and how much does that really impact investors in Australia and which, which sectors specifically? I would say, firstly, uh, take a very close look. If you're concerned about China's growth story, take a very close look at the commodity exposure that you've got, particularly iron ore. Iron ore and copper are the two commodities that are very heavily um, linked to China, and the rest of them are actually relatively diversified, so not, not as much a concern, but take a close look at that. Secondly, take a close look at regional assets. That might be you know, banks that have lent, uh, will lend a lot more into WA, uh, Queensland, and to a lesser extent into South Australia, because they're going to be far more exposed to China. And thirdly, anything Australian will certainly during that perception phase, uh, we'll, we'll get a very close level of consideration by global investors. And Australian equities, for example, will probably not do as well uh, as equities around the world in that sort of downturn. Yeah, well, I guess as you're making your observations there about the impact on portfolio construction, I'm thinking specifically about significant, I guess, changes to strategic asset allocation and the type of strategy 
investors are allocating to in their portfolio, i.e. reducing exposure to hard commodities and and potentially the ASX going through a, a more prolonged period of underperformance compared to the developed world uh, share markets too. So it's um, it's quite profound, this change, as I think you're quite, as you're articulating there, Craig. In terms of potentially even reducing exposure to equities and maybe taking risk out of a portfolio, I guess at the end of the day, most people would think that will lead to lowering returns. So do you think that is the case? So are we in for a longer period of lower returns? No, look, I don't necessarily think so. And this is why I really focus my role around overall asset allocation, because all investors or every investor has a different need for things like growth rates, need for income, and need for capital growth appreciation. So everyone's going to have a different outlook. I've always had the view that the reason we have strategic asset allocation is so that you can you can um, embed the sorts of overall beliefs um, about world growth, about particular sector growth, about particular thematics, and then come up with an asset allocation to suit that. I think there'll be lower growth rates in certain growth markets, like certain sectors of the equity cycle. I think it's fair, you mentioned before, when we talk about um, you know people's, how they allocate their money between different asset classes. The other big change, I think in certainly 2024, 25, and the next few years, um, is that there'll be more demand, more importance uh, placed on active asset selection uh, than there is than there has been in the past. That's good news if you're a fund manager, but if you're an investor, if you're a real person, um, then the the message there is you don't throw away all of your equities, you don't throw all, away all of your bonds or all of your property, nor do you throw all of your money into one of those sectors. You start looking for what are the thematics that are going to drive prices uh, and make sure that you're not sitting in front of a risk that could get ahead of you. And and I think China is one of those where the risk of a Chinese slowdown, firstly, it can be quantified in the way that we've talked about already today, but, but it's also very hard to understand the risks of China when the central government operates so differently, the economy operates so differently to what, what we're used to in the Western world, that there's this unidentifiable, unquantifiable level of risk. And for a lot of people, it means don't get exposed to that level of risk when you can't quantify what it is and, and you don't really understand you know, whether what the level of returns might be. You've mentioned some areas of caution going forward for investors, like exposure to iron ore and the potential impact on Western Australia and Queensland from a slowing Chinese economy. But I guess it'll also have a reasonably profound impact on the AUD, the value of the AUD. And I'm, I guess thinking ahead, I'm thinking what that then means for hedging and unhedging your offshore assets in a portfolio. So I'm, I'm assuming from the takeout, you would be leaning towards more unhedged exposures for offshore assets. It's an interesting question because, um, so I won't answer the question around whether I personally prefer hedged or unhedged directly, because it does really depend on where an, an individual sees their liabilities. Yeah, I get it. If we're going to travel a lot, for example, I'm going to spend my time traveling the world on one of those big cruise ships, then I'm, I'm probably more likely to want to hedge the currency risk and make sure I'm not exposed to a falling AUD. One of the things that I encourage all investors to look at, particularly when they do have a a high level of offshore future spending, is to really understand that the way that you invest, what you choose to invest in, whether that's equities or bonds or property, uh, and how much you choose to have, how much exposure you choose to have to the Australian dollar, then they're not linked to each other. Don't make asset class decisions based on currency. So for example, um, I can invest in international shares and leave it unhedged and therefore be um, short the effectively short the Australian dollar. And I can do exactly the same thing with corporate bonds. Um, and I can do the same thing with property for that matter. It's a little harder, but it's possible. Where I invest in a US dollar corporate bond or property or share and don't hedge that back into Australian dollars. I can get the same sort of level of risk, the same sort of level of income, but I can at the same time 
have myself exposed to a currency that's offshore. The other way to answer that question is more be more direct about it and say, you know, your premise at the start, Paul was exactly right to say that if that outlook is right around China, particularly around iron ore and the exports um, of our commodities, if that outlook's right, it's not good news for the Australian dollar. And so that would mean that the Aussie potentially falls even from its relatively low levels now into the 50s if I'm an investor that's left myself unhedged to the Australian dollar. So in other words, I'm uh, exposed to the US dollar or euro, then I'm quite likely to benefit from that. So what areas of the market make sense to you at the moment and where there could be potential opportunity? I, th- I think this is we're entering into a period of relatively high uncertainty. It's difficult to understand the level of risk that China creates because we haven't had that life experience ourselves. And economists and fund managers are famous at looking backwards. They're they're all looking to the past to try and draw a picture of the future. Uh, And we've never seen an economy of the sheer scale and its controlled and and centrally controlled model. Uh, We've never seen that before. So I'm not a believer in looking backwards to go forwards. I would much sooner say there are some sectors of the economy, some sectors of investments I will not understand. And therefore, if I'm investing in those sectors, I'm doing so on more on faith than I am on on investment fundamentals. So it's highly unlikely I'm going to be investing there. This sort of approach that the FRI would suggest is which sectors do we understand well? And contrary to popular belief, contrary to the media, while Australia is heavily exposed to China, if China were to tr- dramatically slow down, once the dust settles, once markets get over themselves and realise uh, that the reality is not as bad as the perception, Australia is actually in a very, very strong position because the sectors that are heavily uh, linked to the health of the Chinese economy are limited, um, even within the mining sector, for example, li- limited around iron ore um, and copper in particular, but property development, finance, the service sector, um, these are not sectors that are heavily exposed to a China slowdown. The flip side of a China slowdown is, what does that mean for other economies around the world? Um, who's going to step into their place? Um, I, I grew up in, uh, in a time in which J- Japanese was a compulsory language in high school because according to common belief, Japan was going to take over the world. By the time I finished high school, Japan was had gone into recession and it turned out to be a huge waste of time. There's nothing stopping China. In fact, it's it's following a very specific pass of the, the proverbial lost decade that Japan faced. Um, there's nothing stopping China from going into 10 or 20 years of slowdown and someone else steps in their place. Um, in my view, that would be India. Okay, yeah. well, what's India short on? They're short on energy. They're extremely short on uh, being able to produce enough energy to be, to sustain that level of growth. They're a service economy driven model, so it's different to what China would be. Um, and India is by far uh, not the, the only choice that people have. There's also large segments of places like Pakistan, Mexico, and then of course there's, there's Africa as well. All of which is to say that the sector's worth investing in, the sector's worth avoiding actually is probably the better place to start are limited to the ones that are too heavily exposed to china iron ore and copper are the two to avoid but actually much of the rest of the sectors really are in a very strong position uh, and that really drives you know, you asked before the question of do i but does investing to suit the same mean lower returns not necessarily it means having a really good understanding of what level of risk i'm taking Avoiding sectors that I do not understand the risk in and backing those sectors that are going to do well under under this environment in which China does slow down. Yeah, and I think all, all wise comments there, Craig, in terms of how we all reflect on our strategic asset allocation. And I think the observation I, I'll make in listening to your comments there is whilst China may not be creating the or be the contributor to global GDP growth that it has been over the last 30 years, there will always be other opportunity. And I, I think I share your optimism on areas like India, for example, and I think India is a lot easier for us Westerners to understand given the rule of law and democracy also in that country there. 
we'll call it in to the uh, to the podcast there, Craig. But it's been a really fascinating discussion about your views on China and and the move there. I think to uh, from exporting deflation to potentially exporting inflation going forward, and what sort of uh, impact its property market slowdown will have not only on China's GDP growth rate but also on the um, the world there. And I think it gives all of us and all of the podcast listeners some really good insights to reflect on in our own portfolios and how we manage our asset allocation there. So thank you very much for joining us this morning there, Craig. And it's great to hear from yourself and the update on income asset management, the business and how the business is also democratising bonds and corporate bonds in terms of making them available to investors. So I thank you for the time and your insights, Craig. Thanks very much, Paul. And to the listeners, thank you very much again for joining us on today's instalment of the Net Wealth Portfolio Construction Podcast Series. I hope you enjoyed the discussion with Craig as much as I have, and I'll look forward to you joining us on the next instalment of the podcast. So have a great day, everyone, and all the best. Cheers. Thanks for listening to NetWealth's Portfolio Construction Podcast. Follow the show for future episodes. Leaving a review helps others find the podcast. And for more information and show transcripts, visit netwealth.com.au.